This is Friday, February 1st, 2019. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Maureen Sullivan, and we are privileged to have with us today Arthur Robert. Welcome, Arthur. Thank you. May I ask when you were born? I was born on September 11th, 1964. And where were you born? Manchester, New Hampshire. And what community do you currently live in? Natick, Massachusetts. Your marital status? I'm married, happily. Do you have children? I have two. Any grandchildren yet? No, my, my two children are in college. I'm, that will come in time. <laughs> yes. And uh, tell us about life in Manchester, New Hampshire. Well, I grew up in Manchester in the 1960s and 70s. Mm -hmm. uh, the city at the time uh, was still recovering from the closure of the Emiskeg Mills in the 1930s. The mills dominated the community and dominated the economy. And with the closure of the mills, uh, the, the economy really hadn't recovered at that point. Mm -hmm. And I think many people will, and many families were still trying to find their way. And what did your father do for a living? My father is a plumber. And your mother? My mother's primary occupation was uh, raising the family. I'm one of uh, 12 children, and that was her focus until about the point when I was in high school, at which point she started working mm -hmm. in the retail, retail world. And did you go to schools in Manchester? I did. And during that time, were you made aware of events happening, especially the Vietnam War? I, the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. I don't think it was necessarily presented to me. I think I've always had an interest in, in what was going on in the world around me. And uh, I recall even as, as early as third grade trying to understand what was happening in Vietnam. And I recall a, um, I recall putting together a fairly sophisticated uh, project for school of all about it. And at one time, I did have a, um, one of those uh, POW bracelets that, that was a result of that. So when and where did you enter the military? I entered the military while I was still in high school in 1981. I enlisted in the uh, United States Army Reserve and uh, prior to graduation, I, I drilled with the unit on weekends. Mm -hmm. And what uh, made you choose the Army? Well, I think I've always had the sense of the importance of serving in some way. My father served during the Korean conflict as a Marine. Uh, leaving college as a platoon leader corps student to, uh, to do his part. And uh, prior to that, my grandfather and my great uncle both served during World War I. So mm -hmm. I, I think for me, there was always a sense that I would have to do my part. I can't say I was really sure what that meant, but I, I think from the outset, at least some, some role in the military would, would be important. So what happened after you graduated from Manchester? I'm assuming Manchester High School? Well, Central High School Central in Manchester. School. Oh, okay. Actually, I have three. Mm -hmm. But after graduating from high school, I think two days later, I was on a, I was on a uh, bus heading for basic training, U.S. Army basic training at Fort Dix, New Jersey. And was this the first time you were away from home? It was the longest stretch being away from home. Mm -hmm. But prior to that, I think I had spent maybe a week away as a, as a Boy State participant in high school. So uh, tell us a bit about BASIC. It's attention getting. <laughs> um, it, it, BASIC has the, uh, the, unique the unique characteristics of, of stripping away a lot of the, I'm not going to use good words here, but BASIC has, has a, a way of stripping away a lot of the, the veneers and the airs and the, the the social constructs that separate us. I was thrown into a platoon of maybe 50 people, including a combination of uh, reserve, reservists that were heading for, for college, like myself, uh, and a large group of uh, uh, black and, and Puerto Rican new soldiers who were largely 
either in gangs or escaping from gangs in, in communities like Jersey City. So it was, it was a melting pot where we had to figure out how to work together very quickly. And uh, along the way, a lot of the, the, the trappings of society that divided us was, was forci were forcibly stripped away. So tell us what, uh, how long were you in basic? Well, it was nine weeks. So it, was a, it, was, it was essentially for the, the duration of the summer. And, a very hot summer, I assume. <laughs> well, I think, <laughs> I think anybody who goes through basic training in the summer will, would argue that it's, it's been the hottest it's ever been. Uh, Fort Dix is, is uh, at least at the time, was known for having lots of beach sand laid on the, the trails and, and at the different ranges so that as part of the conditioning process when you're out marching from, mm -hmm. from point A to point B, uh, kick up a lot of dust. And if you weren't in the first platoon in the company formation, you would be behind, you know, dealing with the heat, the humidity, which was really, was really tough that mm -hmm. summer, as well as tremendous, tremendous dust. So after nine weeks of sand, dust, whatever, mm -hmm. Uh, what happened next? Well, on, on completing basic training, on graduation, I returned home and started uh, college at uh, the University of New Hampshire. And uh, I also enrolled in the ROTC program uh, while I continued to serve concurrently as an Army Reservist. Mm -hmm. And tell us what that was like. <laughs> That's a broad question. Well. <laughs> Having gone to college myself in that period uh, down at mm -hmm. UMass Amherst, I mm -hmm. knew that uh, those who were in the ROTC program weren't exactly the big men on campus. Was it the same way up there? Well, I, my, under, my recollection is that the ROTC program had been reestablished on campus only within the previous five years. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the cadet battalion was not very large. I think that certainly uh, the, the cadets collectively, we formed a, a pretty tight community. I think you could argue that our outlook maybe was a little bit more different than the, than the students around us. I think generally, I, my sense is that we were a little bit more focused. Um, what are some other ways to characterize it? For me, coming from basic training to a, a college environment, I had a, a pretty strong sense of the importance of autonomy and control after being, after having surrendered so much of that during basic training, that I, I think I had a, a strong set of preferences that led, led me, uh, how can I put this, running in a direction somewhat counter to many of my peers. Arthur, what was your major at UNH? Uh, political science. Okay. And I studied uh, I completed a number of economics courses as well. And did you graduate from UNH? I did in 1986. And you, but you also continued your Army Reservist? Correct. I earned, a, I earned a commission as a second lieutenant in 1984 and continued to serve with my unit drilling on weekends and taking mm -hmm. part in annual training. Okay. I just wanted to uh, clarify, this mm -hmm. is the Army Reserve? Correct. But not the National Guard? Correct. Okay, Army Reserve. And where would you uh, normally train? Well, our, my unit of assignment was located in Manchester, New Hampshire, so we, we spent a fair amount of time at our Army Reserve Center. but at, during field training, we did go to a number of different locations. Fort Devens, the Air Force has a, an air, a tracking, space tracking facility in New Boston, New Hampshire, uh, Rochester, New Hampshire, other, other locations. When on active duty, locations included Fort Benning, Georgia, Fort Dix, New Jersey, and Fort Campbell, Kentucky. Mm -hmm. And did you have any kind of specialty? I was commissioned as, a, as an infantry officer. And you actually were in the Army in the 1980s when mm. it was undergoing tran a very deep transitional period uh, when the uniforms started changing, even the food was starting to change. Uh, what were your um, recollections on that? 
Well, it's an interesting question because um, I think the shift to the all-volunteer force in the leadership that assumed control of the, of, of the Army in the wake of uh, the Vietnam War, there was a huge push for modernization, a huge push for professionalization. Uh, as a reservist at that time, we were never really uh, pr a priority for equipment. Mm -hmm. But one thing that always has struck me about the military, starting from that point, was a tremendous focus on uh, training and professional development. Uh, either being sent away on active duty for training. For example, I completed the field artillery officer basic course in 1987, which was, as I recall, about five months of, of learning the, the science of artillery and the art of leadership. But prior to that and since, uh, there were certainly many different opportunities to, to get training to learn more about what it means to be an effective soldier as well as learning more about what it takes to be an effective leader. And that, that focus and that emphasis was very clear even given my role in a unit that wasn't a high priority organization. I, I served in, a, in a, uh, a, m a mobilization training company which is, which is a, a long way of saying I was part of a company of uh, drill sergeants and our mission was on mobilization to go to a training center like mm -hmm. Fort Benning and take over a, a basic training company and run it and run several cycles of soldiers through basic training. Mm -hmm. So we had to know what it meant to be a soldier. We had to mm -hmm. develop an understanding of leadership as well as an understanding of the Army culture to, to properly Trans transition new recruits you know, into effective soldiers. Now Arthur, during this period, uh, did you have a civilian job? Well, certainly after I graduated, I had a, a number of different jobs. My, my thought was always to, to pursue addish, additional uh, civilian education. So in um, 1989, I was accepted into the International Relations Program at Syracuse University. I actually put off attending for a year to raise the money to do it. Mm -hmm. And I enrolled in the, the fall of 1990. And then the following year something happened. Correct. Correct. And that something was, happened to be the Persian Gulf War. Yes. Correct. So, Take it away and uh, tell us what happened. <laughs> well, it's an interesting story because uh, attending graduate school has its own demands and challenges. Excuse me, I remained in the Army Reserve and I transferred to a unit in Syracuse, New York, not, not far from the school, uh, that, is, that, was, that was the 403rd Civil Affairs Company, a very different organization, a very different mission, and one that took a while to really fully appreciate. Uh, moving from a, a culture defined by drill sergeants, standards, preparing individuals for combat, to an organization that's, that was all about helping a military commander effectively manage relationships with and obligations to a civilian population that inevitably is part of a, a combat zone. Mm -hmm. So instead of dealing with folks, drill sergeants who understood weapons, understood how to train in hand-to-hand -hand combat as examples, I had to get comfortable working with uh, soldiers who actually brought different skills to work on different problems. Bankers, lawyers, stockbrokers, municipal managers that uh, on deployment would perform very different functions. And that is to help make sure communities function, that basic needs are being met, and that commanders understood the civilian population around them. So as you can imagine, the transition from working with drill sergeants to who are very sharp, very focused, to uh, this very different kind of soldier who, who are more focused on their civilian attributes than their and their military training and skills was a little, was a little jarring, mm -hmm. especially for a young lieutenant like myself. 
So take us into uh, the early part of 1991 when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait. Well, if I, I've, I've thought about this, and I think the, for me the appropriate point of departure for this was actually the previous, I believe it was the, it was the previous winter mm -hmm. where uh, I was able to work on a few days of active duty for my unit. Um, and I was asked to update the unit's mobilization files. Uh, every unit uh, in the reserves or in the National Guard has a, has a mobilization plan that basically enables the transition from what's called inactive status to active status. And there are many different elements of that plan that relate to personnel, intelligence, operations, and logistics that need to be pretty much set to ease that transition from inactive to active status. Mm -hmm. I focused on the operational piece and I found that uh, the unit really wasn't pre fully preparing its, for its post-mobilization training meaning training that's completed after being called to duty but before being deployed. Mm -hmm. and I spent a, a lot of time updating that to be sure that the, the unit, if it ever were to be mobilized, would be able to access the resources it needs and set aside the time that it needs to be sure that we are able to A, perform our mission, but just as important, survive and protect ourselves on the battlefield. So. Having done that, I, I guess I never really thought much of it until the following August. And during August, I did have some active duty time again. And I guess there, 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 are, there are two interesting, or, or, or two points that stand out you know, not long after the invasion took place. The first was, uh, while doing some work, television was on, everybody wanted to know what was, what was happening. And there was a moment when then President Bush was asked a few questions while, about what was happening before getting on a helicopter. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't, it wasn't really clear what anybody should expect, but after he offered, answered questions, he, 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 he basically offered a phrase akin to, you know, this invasion of Kuwait will not stand. In my mind, at that point, it was just a matter of time. Mm -hmm. And very interestingly, several days later, while still on active duty, I, I paid a visit to our unit's mobilization site or mobilization station. As part of that mobilization planning process, units typically visit their mobilization site every year and make sure that they have relationships with the mobilization staff and provide and share updates with regard to mobilization plans. Well, you can imagine, you know, at that point, that kind of visit was, would not likely be as perfunctory as you might think. And while it was long planned, we did visit myself and a, and a, a staff sergeant that was also assigned to the unit. The, the visit to the mobilization officer's office was, was, was eye-opening, to say the least. As you might expect, there was a lot of chaos, pandemonium almost in terms of equipment being moved, maps being put up at that time, acetate overlays being placed on maps, phones ringing, people talking urgently. When we got to our mobilization officer's desk, we, we talked a little bit, exchanged pleasantries, then as we were doing this, I could not help but notice that on his desk, there were three stacks of paper. A short one, uh, let's say one of intermediate size, short may, be a, may have been an inch, intermediate, let's just say two, and the, the big one was four inches. So I, as a lieutenant at the time, maybe I, I was a little impertinent, impertinent, but I couldn't help but ask. So you know, what are these stacks? And the response was, these stacks represent the lists of, of units that, that could be mobilized you know, for, for war in the future. And at that point, I couldn't help but ask the follow-up question. Is our unit in any of these stacks? And he looked me straight in the eye and he said, you're in all of them. 
So I had to take that secret back, shared that information with my operations officer in a, in a, a walk around his neighborhood, and had to carry that, that, mm -hmm. that knowledge while completing a semester of school, which wasn't an easy thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think my wife will ever forgive me for not telling her, mm -hmm. but uh, it was just a, a, a stark reality. And from that point forward, it was clear to me that I had to do everything I could do to physically and uh, professionally prepare and do the best to help my unit do the same. So when did the call come? The call, the call came just before Christmas. I was working as an intern in, in uh, the Niagara Mohawk Power Corporation, which at the time was a, a large uh, independent company headquartered in Syracuse. And I, I got a call from someone I had never met before. And at the time, a, a, an alert order would be sure, shared by, if shared by telephone, would be used two code words. Um, one, if it was just a, a practice, the code words were um, grazing herd. And if it was for real, it was a roaring bull. So for this person I'd never met before, he called and introduced himself and said right from the front, this is a roaring bull message. So I said, Okay, thank you. Where do I need to be and when? I got my phone, packed up my, turned off my computer, packed up my desk, and left. And we were mobilized, I believe it was on the 27th mm -hmm. of December, a day or two after Christmas. So I did have the opportunity to spend Christmas with, with my family, before it, which meant driving from Syracuse to Manchester, then Manchester back out to Syracuse to, to start the process which during winter, as you know, can be a dicey <laughs> proposition, but it, it was fine. There, was no, there were no real weather issues. And where were you mobilized? We, we were sent to Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Our, our mobilization station was to be Fort Meade, Maryland, but our unit was reassigned mm -hmm. to uh, the United States Army Civil Affairs and Psychological Operations Command. So we were considered in some basic way a, a special operations asset <clears throat> as a result of that reassignment. So we were sent to their, their headquarters and we, we, we did uh, about a month of post-mobilization training at Fort Bragg. So that takes us to late January 1991. Mm -hmm. What happens next? I can't put my finger on the date, but inevitably the, the time to go was what, what arrived. We were sent to uh, Pope Air Force Base, which is on the opposite side of Fort Bragg. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and uh, when our time came, I believe it was like three or four in the morning, we all took our turns climbing onto one of two C5s, C5 galaxy, C5A mm -hmm. galaxies. Um, that our unit was assigned that kind of transportation asset, you know, reflected a very high priority. I think that the folks very high above our level wanted to be sure that as the American Army got involved in uh, a very different environment, that commanders had what they needed to, to manage not just a different people and culture, but urban settings, specifically Kuwait City. What I remember most about that moment was as we gathered our equipment and our weapons and headed for the plane to climb the, the, the ladder to get inside, get on board, we were surrounded, or each, each flank of, the, of our approach to the aircraft were lined by military policemen. So it was certainly time to go and the fact that you didn't, ha didn't have an option was, was <laughs> very, very clear. <clears throat> Not that it was an, a, a, an issue for me, but it was just a, 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 it was a, clear, a very clear sign of the, gra the gravity or the magnitude of, of what, was, what we were getting involved in. 
All right, you're on a C5. You're heading out of North Carolina. Where mm -hmm. did you guys touch down? Uh, we touched down in Massachusetts very briefly. Uh, what's the air base that's just north of Chicopee? Oh, Edwards? No, that's, that's on the Cape. Oh, yeah. Well, we, we stopped briefly in mm -hmm. Massachusetts. Then we flew on to Torreon, Spain. We stayed on the ground for a few hours, you know, for aircraft maintenance, refuel, et cetera. What was another indicator of just how big uh, what was going on was uh, these, these planes don't have big windows, but occasionally you know, you, you, I could muscle up to one and, and see what was going on around me. I recall counting something like 30, something like 30, 30 C5 tails which I think at the time the United States had maybe 90 of them, which meant a, a huge part of uh, our, our air transport fleet, you know, the most precious assets mm -hmm. were involved and we were, we were part of it. So that was another, you know, attention getting kind of moment. All right, and from Spain to? We flew on to Ultimately, Saudi Arabia, we landed in a, at an airfield <clears throat> outside of an industrial community known as Al-Jubal. We landed in daylight, and it was a, because you're flying inside a dark aircraft for so long, the first, the, the first sensation or thought was it, uh, something like a, a Capricorn One moment. Do you recall that movie? Somewhat, yes. The movie was, as I recall it, mm -hmm. was all about essentially a staged uh, mission, space mission to Mars that was all executed you know, on film. It wasn't for mm -hmm. real and the, the, the public was being deceived. What really struck me about flying all of the, being in that plane for so long and not seeing anything, finally landing on the ground, we were able to you know, get Personnel, we were able to get off the plane. We had to figure out how we we're going to move our equipment off, but the first step was to get the people off the plane. My first observation was, you know, this this can't be anything. Th 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 we we can't possibly be on the other side of the world. It felt like we had just been in a box, and the box opened, and <laughs> being out on airfield, I was thinking, well, maybe we're in California. It's just a jarring kind of juxtaposition going from a really dark place where you couldn't see anything forever to suddenly out onto this open uh, tarmac surrounded by desert on each side. It didn't take long for us to, to understand that, that, you know, in fact we were someplace very different when the first uh, air raid alarm went off. For, and for us, we weren't really sure what to expect, but we could see that people on the airfield uh, the airmen that were staffing the airfield, once the, the alarm was given, they wasted no time running for shelter, running for bunkers. And I think it was at that point you realized, you know, we weren't in Kansas, so to speak, anymore. We were, it, was, it was all for real. At that, at that point, the Iraqis were launching Scud missiles mm -hmm. from positions in Iraq that were striking in different locations <coughs> in Kuwait. It was, a, it was a false alarm, at least for us, but uh, it was certainly attention getting. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit about the uniform and some of the equipment that uh, you had. First of all, mm -hmm. the uniform, uh, were you wearing a battle, battle uh, uniform? Well, folks, soldiers in the Army have a, a duty uniform. Mm -hmm which for, at the time was called the battle dress uniform. It was a green camouflage <coughs> uh, pair of pants and, and a blouse. I mean, that's, that's, that's the basis of it. And we hadn't received any issue of equipment specific for that part of the world. So we, we left North Carolina essentially with the, the equipment that we had, which was oriented towards fighting in Europe. Mm -hmm. So in addition to the, the basic uniform, we had <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, pretty much the basic load of what we would carry as, as individual soldiers: uh, a, a harness and a web belt that supported two canteens, an entrenching tool, 
uh, ammo pouches, first aid kit. We also had carried a gas mask, and we were also carried a, uh, a chemical protective overgarment, so that if needed, you know, we had we had them immediately available. And what was uh, another point that was definitely different, unlike stateside service, you know, we were issued bayonets. That is unusual. Which is another indicator of you know being in being in theater and having a. a prospects for being involved in something very serious. You know, other differences included as part of the chemical uh, preparedness being issued uh, uh, atropine auto injectors so that if, if you were to be afflicted with a chemical agent, atropine is a, is a drug that accelerates the, bo processing, the body's processing of whatever's in it with the goal of getting it out. Again, something you don't typically see. Mm. There, were, there were other things too, but mm -hmm. in addition to that, of course, we all we all had a had a helmet to protect our, ourselves from you know head injuries. Right. Okay. Your um, your first days in Saudi Arabia. Now, were you uh, kind of put in a special part of the field, or were you being uh, combined with other units? Well, there was a lot of confusion, and I think our, our ultimate mission was somewhat <coughs> different than, than most units. There was confusion in part because we were a, a United States Army asset, but we were our, our wartime mission was to be assigned to the headquarters of the 1st Marine Expeditionary Force. Uh, as you might expect, there was some confusion and communication around that, so the first couple of days were spent in part acclimatizing and, and adjusting to the, you know, the huge time difference. But in part, I think our, our leaders and the, the Marine Corps leaders were trying to figure out what to do with us. <clears throat> Meaning, where, where, where do you billet people? How are they going to draw rations? Um, where are they going to seek shelter if there's an air raid? Those sorts of things. And it, and it wasn't easily resolved. I can tell you that <clears throat> our first experience with Marine Corps food created a, a new motivation to, to find a different solution. The sea rations that we were offered were, were absolutely horrible. <laughs> and um, it's funny how something like that can, can drive ingenuity to find a different solution. Mm -hmm. I am a little surprised because I believe by that time the sea rations were being phased out in favor of the first generation MREs. Well, let, let me be clear. You, you're, you're right about that, mm -hmm. but the, the, the hot food that is served to Marines while on board boats while deployed uh, is hot. It's not in individual pouches or bags. It's, you know, it's designed to serve units. Mm -hmm. But the, it was clearly, you know, the first priority is always for making sure that it's, it's shelf stable. And uh, it was pretty bad. It was definitely a morale blow. All right. So that motivated our command to find a different place, different location, and different support relationship to help the unit do it, help the units be supported while the unit executed its mission, which was to support the, the Marine Corps headquarters. And did your command fi find a different spot? Yes. Okay. After, if I recall, better part of a week, <clears throat> we were able to fall in on um, Army contracted uh, uh, housing, essentially uh, work camp housing that, that was occupied by foreign laborers who were working in nearby petrochemical plants. Uh, we were able to fall in on some vacant space. So we, we had a separate place, we had a secure location, we had a clear idea of where to go and, and um, call, our, call our home, whatever you want to call it. And uh, critically, we had access to a, an army serviced mess hall, <clears throat> which was actually, you know, by comparison, you know, it was good, it was mm -hmm. adequate. Where the, 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 the key thing was that there was always some fresh fruit available, I mean, regardless of whatever else was in the mix. You had that piece to keep yourself happy and, and regular. Okay, Arthur, uh, tell us what happened next. 
you're, now you're in Saudi Arabia, you're pretty mm -hmm. much settled. Mm -hmm. And let's see, now we're talking how, how far along in 1991? Well into the, the air war. Okay. So we're, we're, what, what's really striking about this experience is that a lot happened in a short amount of time. And I think a lot of people didn't really process it, didn't really have time to process it, including myself. But we spent our time as, a, as an organization working with the Marine Corps headquarters. Uh, any headquarters had, in, in any military organization has elements that focus on personnel, intelligence, operations, and logistics. Civil affairs is a function within operations, especially at a high headquarters. The Marine Expeditionary Force level, if I recall correctly, is a three-star command. <clears throat> so it's a very high level. And the headquarters, by definition, is, is robust because a three-star general has tremendous reach and has, needs a lot of help mm -hmm. in managing those a the assets mm -hmm. under, under control. Mm -hmm. And we got involved in various aspects of, of planning for the liberation of, of Kuwait. You know, from the m mundane, relatively mundane aspects of identifying resources to be brought into country, <coughs> planning for the transport of those, identifying who the receiving parties or entities would be. Mm -hmm. and there, was some all, there was also some engagement with um, the Iraqi resistance within the country. Mm -hmm. And did you yourself uh, have any encounter with the Iraqi resistance or any of the locals? Certainly with many locals in Saudi Arabia and eventually mm -hmm. Kuwait, but never any <clears throat> direct uh, interaction with, with folks in the resistance. Okay. So now we're talking about, uh, you just mentioned the, the air war that was mm -hmm. taking place but your units were getting ready for a ground offensive, correct? Correct. And when did that ground offense start? Well, it was the end of February. End of February. Okay. I can't put my, I apologize, I did not go back and look at timelines and whatnot. That's okay. <clears throat> but a lot of our initial work was what you could call staff work, mm -hmm. working with different elements of, of the high mm -hmm. command. But as we approached, as the ground war date mm -hmm. approached, well, we didn't know exactly what it was. Mm -hmm. Our unit was eventually to be broken down and attached to subordinate headquarters. Okay. So we were eventually staged further north from Al Jubal mm -hmm. for, through a small town called Kafji or Al Kafji, and then heading first west and then north into uh, mm -hmm. the Marine Corps staging areas mm -hmm. in Saudi Arabia, just just uh, outside of the, the Kuwait border. Okay, and I understand you have a map. I do. Well, I have maps, yes. Okay, why don't you... Um... They're really kind of kind of silly. They're not tactical maps, but may, there, may be, there may be one or two that could be useful. Okay. I mean, this is a... All right. This, this provides a little bit of a, a view. Okay, if you can just uh, a little bit higher, if you will, please. Of course, if that, that helps. Uh, just a scotch higher, please. Excellent. Okay, so where where were you located first? Well, uh, the, the, the city of Aljubal or the port of Aljubal is a bit further south, uh -huh. off the map. When it was our time to move forward north, we moved through a, a, a small town called Al Kafji, which was mm -hmm subject of a, like a brigade level fight or, or, or Iraqi incursion just before the ground war started. Yeah. We saw some evidence of that and we passed through it. Mm -hmm. But we ultimately spent a lot of time in convoy on, comp uh, on compacted uh, sand roads running generally west and then north to you know, the marine staging areas, which is mm -hmm. roughly there. And of course Kuwait City is right there. Here, just for the purpose, yeah. So it gets folks located. This is the Kuwait border defined mm -hmm. in black here. And of course, at the time, uh, 
when you were there, uh, mm -hmm. were you given regular updates as what was happening? No. <laughs> we had, we, well, to be clear, we, we had a general sense of what was happening operationally, but the, the specifics one would hope for, I think, never, never arrive, at least in my military experience. You get bits and pieces, and as time goes on, you're able to put together a picture. Mm -hmm. But there was, I wouldn't call it so much confusion, but there was a lot of anticipation, maybe uninformed anticipation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, being deployed forward, waiting, waiting for our call to, to, to make the next moves. <clears throat> you know, the Marines had moved through from their positions, you know, basically south, north and east, you know, towards Kuwait City. And instead of a major fight that was anticipated, it was, it was pretty, it was pretty lopsided. So the, the combat phase, you know, for the Marines here, the EPAC forces here, and the bulk of the United States Army, which moved this way, uh, it, was, it was fast and furious, you know, 100 days, excuse me, 100 hours. So we were in position expecting first to support, <clears throat> support uh, the Marine Corps in a, in a combat mission, but it ended very quickly. So uh, there was a, a rapid transition to uh, restoring order in, in setting con conditions for reconstruction in Kuwait. <coughs> Excuse me. Mm -hmm. And our unit got involved in different aspects of that. You know, primarily organizing and, and leading uh, convoys of uh, relief equipment and relief supplies you know, into uh, Kuwait City. When you were heading into Kuwait City, and I've seen mm -hmm a lot of the photos of this, this trail of destruction that was left by the end of the air war. Did you see any of that? Well, yes, but mm -hmm. I, I think, l let me try to put that in context. A lot mm -hmm. of what people saw on television actually did not happen in Kuwait itself, Kuwait City itself. <clears throat> it happened outside of the city along, along a, a highway heading first west and then north in, towards the Iraqi border. The city itself, you know, my, my primary impressions included the fact that it was obviously run down from, not, from a lack of good public services over many months. Uh, it had a, a smell of decay that I think could be, you know, character, could be explained for a number of reasons. Um, <clears throat> there, there were neighborhoods that were primarily Palestinian that were surrounded by uh, Arab forces with their weapons facing into the neighborhoods, which said something about the level of trust, at least you know, based on the information that was available on the ground at the time, in that uh, there were other efforts on the part of the Iraqis to prepare different parts of the city for a, for a defense, but they weren't generally well developed or well implemented. It seemed to me that there was just as much effort put into um, <clears throat> setting up roadblocks and controls directed at the civilian population, more oriented towards occupation than defense. So was the city itself heavily damaged? There was, there was certainly war-related damage, but uh, I, I think that there was a lot of effort invested into you know, managing the threat of, of uh, the possibility of uh, civilian casualties. And the Iraqi army the, that was the target was very much in the field, either in Kuwait <clears throat> or in the case of the Republican Guard, a good, a good chunk of it was still in Iraq. So this, this idea of destruction, yeah, there was, it was a war-torn city, but it, it wasn't the subject of, of intense at aerial attack. It wasn't the subject of, a, of an intense ground battle. Mm -hmm. So, Arthur, now your units is, are in north and west of Kuwait City. Is that correct? Well, we, we, had, we were south and west in, south in, and west. in, mm -hmm. in uh, Saudi Arabia. We were pushed forward into Kuwait City mm -hmm. and took up... Uh, took up space or took up residence, if you will, 
in the grounds of the uh, education, Coedia Education Ministry. <clears throat> if I recall correctly, a good chunk of that was in parking garages and things like that, mm -hmm. where we had a place to, to, to call home, mm -hmm. get organized, and, and execute the missions that we were assigned. Mm -hmm. And what kind of missions were they? Well, as I said before, they were, they were primarily oriented on moving supplies into the country. We are echelons above us. We were, we were very much involved in discussions with the Kuwaiti government about what, what, what kind of assistance was needed. And I think as a rule, while they appreciated help at we call the tactical level, helping to move things and get things organized, I think that there was a certain element of pride that left them reluctant to have um, get assistance in terms of reorganizing government mm -hmm. or reestablishing governmental authority and, and making the different aspects of government work. As, you know, essentially the, the, the core strengths of, of my units and, and the mission that it has. Mm -hmm. And how long were you in Kuwait City? <clears throat> I'm thinking. It wasn't long, two weeks, maybe three weeks. What was really striking about what was happening is that it took a long time to build up the, the forces to fight the fight, but there seemed to be an intense interest to get people out and get, start moving equipment out as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. I mean, the deployment was, was just, a, it's hard, to, it's hard to express, you know, the, the size of it. Different indicators we saw were, <clears throat> you referred to, you know, these meals ready to eat. One, one vision I recall seeing while doing our, our work, driving in, in the desert in Saudi Arabia, is seeing a, essentially a wall of MREs, you know, boxes stacked together. I would say seven, eight, ten feet tall, and what looked like at least 100 yards in length. You know, another indicator, you know, while we were in Al Jubal, we, they, we weren't allowed to enter the port and, you know, for operational reasons. And the priority of the port was to move the Army 7th Corps, you know, from Europe to Saudi Arabia. And every night, while we couldn't see, we could, we could hear what seemed like endless convoys of vehicles leaving and heading north and west of our location. During the uh, time you were in Kuwait City, was it, uh, you were mentioning Scud missiles earlier, were you, uh, did you see, hear anything in the uh, way Scud? At that point, no. No? But okay. Earlier, there were, there were plenty of alerts, and one of the interesting things we learned about the alerts was that the, the systems that were set up to, def to detect the launches, when there was a detection, the alert went out throughout the theater. So everybody got the word and everybody would take cover until they could get a better sense of well, what is the actual trajectory and what's the actual strike point. Um, <clears throat> so there were a lot of alerts and inevitably, you know, folks begin to think after a while, you know, it's not going to happen to me. Um, we had one while we were in Al Jubal explode maybe a mile and a half away. It was certainly something that you could hear, and it was loud. It wasn't a physical danger, but it was one of those attention-getting moments. So what happened after spending two to three weeks in Kuwait City? Well, as I said before, there was a push to, to move units out of theater, and um, we, were, we were tasked to, to move from Kuwait City to Al Jubal, and after spending, a, I'm guessing, about two weeks there, we were given orders to move further south to a, a city called Al Kobar. We were at, the, at that point, it was pretty clear that there, were, there was no additional mission for us. Unlike many other conflicts, there wasn't a big refugee challenge. Civil affairs units typically get involved in managing refugee issues. And for Kuwait, you know, a lot of people left. The people who stayed, stayed. But the people who left typically were people of means. They had left to, to other capitals in the Middle East. And it was safe to come back. They, they came back on their own. 
So with that in mind, uh, the presumption was that there was no mission for us so that we were, we were ordered to move back. <clears throat> and we spent about, I'm, I'm thinking about two weeks preparing, for, preparing to leave country, mm -hmm. which means turning in ammunition you're not, we didn't need, turning in the uh, atropine auto injectors that we weren't having a need for anymore, mm -hmm. preparing our vehicles for shipment, uh, making decisions about what to do with our tentage. There are strict rules in terms of what can be shipped out and what can be accepted out of the theater and be accepted back in the United States. So vehicles had to be cleaned. <clears throat> tentage, I think, generally was not kept. It was disposed of. And along the way, everything has to be, had to be accounted for, people, weapons, and all the, all the equipment that we had. Mm -hmm. I'm just kind of curious, Arthur, how many, um, how many personnel would that be in your case? Well, as a civil affairs company, I recall we had maybe 100 people. 100 people, okay. With a diverse range of skills, very much the opposite <coughs> of an infantry rifle company where you have maybe 120 soldiers, but most of them being having some kind of infantry skill or, or, or set. Mm -hmm. Mission very different, personalities very different as a result. So once equipment's accounted for, personnel accounted for, uh, when did you leave? Well, it, oftentimes in the military, you probably heard of people. You, you probably heard people use the term or phrase "hurry up and wait." Mm -hmm. Well, when when folks are leaving, they're much more motivated, and we are prepared to go much more quickly to go home than, it, than we were to, to, to head to theater. It, what the, the actual slotting of, of, of aircraft and whatnot was something that was, we weren't really given uh, access to until pretty much the last moment. When we, I think we had maybe three hours notice when our turn was to come. And of course, our unit was spread out. We had people going out and doing different things. And uh, we had to bring them all back and get them, get them on the bus, literally, so that we could be ready for, their, for our aircraft. That, that involved, as I recall, like I said, getting on, getting on buses at dusk, arriving at, a, at an airfield and waiting on the airfield on the side of the runway for maybe six or seven hours before our plane landed and we had our chance to board. Just to step back a little bit, uh, did you have an opportunity to uh, send a message to your family? Did you write letters or? Oh, of course. Yeah. Of course. There was, there's, there's always time to make for that. Mm -hmm. And at that point in time, there was at least occasional access to phone booths <clears throat> in some of, these, some of these locations. The only way you could talk to someone is account for the many hours of, of time mm -hmm. difference. So you had to be very careful about when you could actually get to one. Yeah. Of course, the Persian Gulf War was just a few years before email got fully developed. So Correct. It, it almost seems like another time and place, <laughs> well, so to speak. In, in some respects, I think that's fair. Mm -hmm. You know, I think there were something like a half a million of us who were involved in some way. And you know, our role was small and not in the big scheme of things, not really important. And we didn't really have <clears throat> the exposure to, to combat that mm -hmm. many other folks had. But I think just the same, I, it was a, it's, I would call it an experience that's defining, at once defining mm -hmm. and isolating. Before we get you on the plane heading back mm -hmm. to the United States, is there anything else that you recall about your experiences in Saudi Arabia and Kuwait? Um, I can share a few. <clears throat> uh, in one, one case, we had the opportunity to join a, a Saudi family for, for dinner during Ramadan. During Ramadan, among other things, you know, it's an important uh, period in the, in the Islamic faith where during the, the day is characterized by fasting and the evening is characterized by feasting. We had the opportunity to, to visit 
the, the, an apartment, several of us in the unit had the opportunity to visit with a, a Saudi family, a young doctor, a young nurse, <clears throat> who also had two young children. And it was very interesting to hear their perspectives about what's happening in their country and their hopes for the future. Um, and I, another piece I think that was kind of illuminating was the juxtaposition between Saudi Arabia as a very conservative, arguably, arguably puritanical kind of place. We had the opportunity while we were in Kobar, Al Kobar, to uh, hop on a bus, <clears throat> cross the causeway to Bahrain, which just I think maybe six miles by by uh, by bus and bridge is was a very different place, very much more colorful. <clears throat> very much more liberal. Um, alcohol was freely available. Mm -hmm. um, and it was interesting to observe the, the number of Saudi men who were amongst us that were escaping from or complimenting you know, their, their, their lives in Saudi Arabia. It, it's, it seemed a little hypocritical, let me just put it that way. <laughs> and at the time, there just seemed to be hopes for change that obviously have, have only slowly unfolded in mm -hmm. recent years. Okay. All right, so Arthur, you're finally on the plane, and the plane takes off. Where did you guys land? <laughs> <laughs> well, there's some interesting insights. That was an interesting flight. <clears throat> First of all, it was really rough. So it, it seemed to all of us that the Army was trying to find a way to, to deal us its, its last, or extract its last elements of pain. Mm -hmm. But we were on a civilian 747, mm -hmm. which was really interesting. Uh, we had to board with our equipment and our weapons, and it was unusual to hear the, the stewardess ask us to kindly stow our weapons under our seat. You know, that's something you typically talk about while flying. And our unit as part on the 747, I mean, there were, there, were, there were other folks, other units that were on, on this plane, including uh, soldiers from the 82nd Airborne Division. <clears throat> it was very interesting to see how people would spend time, you know, us as reservists trying to find opportunities to sleep, uh, catch up on letter writing and whatnot, while our, our counterparts from the 82nd Airborne Division were you know, hard at work cleaning their weapons at you know, 35,000 feet, you know, amongst the, the seats. and. Um, the, other, the other really striking moment, one of, the, one of the striking moments just in this whole process, I, we knew it was safe or that it was ending uh, first when we were told that we had flown out of uh, Saudi airspace. And the second was they actually, they, they served dinner on the plane. You know, airplane food back, even back then wasn't anything to write home about, but the Dutch butter was something that I hadn't experienced in, in you know many months, and it was again a sure sign of like returning to reality. Of course, flying back, we uh, landed in um, the Netherlands. We weren't allowed off the plane. <clears throat> From there, we flew on. We actually stopped in Boston. Mm -hmm which was pretty exciting, but they wouldn't let us outside of the exterior lounge areas. So even while being in the United States, we hadn't cleared customs. So, you know, we couldn't, we tried calling our, our significant others, you know, to try to arrange a meeting, but, you know, we, there was that, that gap. We were still, we were, we were separated from the real world by, you know, those roll down um, uh, garage doors, but, you know, there's plenty of gaps in between the, like the rods. So we're still, it still felt like, it was a good example of still being in, the, in a cage, if you will, of this, of this whole experience. So when did they let you loose? Uh, it was mid-April, when we were finally done. We, were, we had to return to Fort Bragg. We had to turn in all our equipment. We had to exit physical exams, and um, then it was our turn to leave. We took <clears throat> commercial flight back to Syracuse, New York. And you actually continued to stay in the Army Reserves. Yes. And you actually went through the ranks to Lieutenant Colonel. Correct. 
Were you doing pretty much the same duties? Well, I stayed with that unit for another five years, but uh -huh. in 1991, <clears throat> at the end of the summer, I had finished my studies at Syracuse. My wife and I decided to get married, and we had some choices to make. Mm -hmm. She grew up in Cohasset. I grew up in Manchester, New Hampshire, and mm -hmm. we chose Natick as a location that seemed to be, you know, in terms of drive time anyway, pretty mm -hmm. central, while offering good access to Boston and whatever else might come. We thought it would be a good central location to start from. And uh, by 1995, I had moved from the Army Reserve to the Massachusetts National Guard <coughs> and served in the Guard for about 10 years before retiring in 2005. So you were with the Mass National Guard when 9-11 happened? Correct. And tell us about that. Um, it was a, an interesting time. It was, it was trying, again, an example of a time when there was a lot of chaos. There was a lot of uncertainty about what our roles might be in part of a, what would be a much bigger response that frankly unfolded over the course of years. Uh, you know, early on, I was part of uh, planning for sending uh, National Guard soldiers to New York City <clears throat> to provide security, something that, you know, contingency that didn't unfold. At that point, you know, as a staff officer and as a major, I spent a lot of time updating contingency plans regarding terrorist response and what the National Guard role, well, the role of specific units in the National Guard might be. And those, those are examples, and certainly as time wore on, the Army had needs for individual soldiers and eventually units. And, you know, in the course of my work day, I would get calls, you know, with asking, with questions being asked about how to handle some of those asks. Now, I had, uh, not too long ago, I had another uh, officer had served in the Mass National Guard, and he had you know, not only went through mm -hmm. 2001, but he also was at the Mass, uh, the Democratic National Convention in Boston in 04, and of course, mm -hmm. the, when the Red Sox won the World Series. Mm -hmm. uh, were you involved in any of those, or at least helping? No, no, no. I, no? I, I was assigned, well, I, I was assigned to different <clears throat> units in the Massachusetts National Guard that were part of the artillery community. And you know we had we had individuals assigned to perform specific missions, but I was not deeply involved in, mm -hmm. in planning for those kinds of things. Okay. And where were you stationed, or at least uh, where uh, when you were on active duty or on weekends, where would you go? Well, I started I actually started in <clears throat> Lexington, then New Bedford, Massachusetts, Quincy, Massachusetts, and Rehoboth. So you um, left Army, the Army Reserves, Nat Mass National Guard, rank of lieutenant colonel. Uh, did you earn any medals or commendations? Well, along the way, uh, I think uh, <coughs> I think three Army commendation medals, three Army achievement medals. While deployed, actually, the National Defense Service medal twice, Southwest Asia Service medal. And you know, I'm sure there are others. One that stands out is because we served with the Marines in the First Marine Expeditionary Force, we were awarded something called the Naval Unit Commendation Medal, which is uncommon to see uh, in the Army community. It is unusual. Yeah, and it's something that I think helped mm -hmm. help to help anybody stand mm -hmm. out, and it was a definitely a converse, conversation starter you know, amongst people in uniform. Okay. <coughs> so Arthur, did you join any military service organization such as the VFW or the Legion? I'm an American Legion member. I have not been an active participant. And uh, I, I take it you used the GI Bill to help pay for your education initially? I did not. You did not? I did not. Back Interesting. In, back in the 
80s, there really wasn't much of a GI Bill to fall on. Mm. Um, how about now? Well, there, there certainly is, mm -hmm. and it's certainly tied to active service. Yeah. <clears throat> but I, I had completed most of my graduate studies, and I think there may have been some options after coming back from, from Kuwait and Saudi Arabia, but there was nothing, it was nothing that I, I had an interest in pursuing. Okay, so Arthur, what are you doing these days? These days I actually work for the city of Framingham. I'm the city's community and economic development director. I've been there for about five years. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I know it still seem, sounds strange to call it the city of Framingham, even <laughs> though it's been about a year now. <laughs> yes, that's true. That's true. I've uh, <clears throat> made a point to correct my staff at every turn to try to get them to make that <laughs> mental transition. It's not a simple one. Uh, but it's getting there. It is getting there. What's kind of interesting about this role is uh, I, I've been on the civilian side, I've worked in different um, roles in the economic development profession, really since starting as an economic development intern with the Niagara Mohawk Power Corporation back in 1990. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, a lot of what I did as a civil affairs officer was look at how communities are constructed, uh, understand what it would take to make communities function at a baseline level and ultimately help them function better, perform better. And there are many elements to that, not least of which is the strength and the vitality of the business community and the strength and the robustness of, of infrastructure and ultimately urban design or community design. <clears throat> um, my role in framing him is very much, very much touches on those themes you know, very different kind of context. Certainly a much more developed, mature, uh, vibrant community, frankly. And certainly not one that's, that's, that, that, that has ever suffered the ravages of war. Mm -hmm. But um, that, that work back in the 1990s, I think prepared me well for some of the challenges I'm helping the city wrestle with today. Okay. Arthur, how important was it for you to serve in the military? <clears throat> I think pretty important. Mm -hmm. You know, I had mentioned earlier, you know, what my uh, experiences were and my orientation was, at least as, as early as third grade. Um, I think I've always felt that freedom is not free in that um, there are obligations that, that, that come separate from you know, what the law may require. And I just felt that through military service, I, there was a, a, a good path for me to make a contribution. Mm -hmm. Arthur, is there anything else you'd like to say before we <coughs> wrap this up? Uh, I guess I'd just go back to something I'd mentioned before. You know, my, my experience was interesting, full of irony, and a lot of, a lot of humorous moments that I didn't mention, but I know in the big scheme of things, I was a very small cog in a unit that was frankly far removed from a lot of the execution of the war. Uh, we're not we didn't do anything unusual. We didn't do anything that was, except for maybe on a, a, one or two occasions, life-threatening or be in a, a situation where, <clears throat> you know, health or life was at risk. But um, I know that there are so many, so few of us out there that um, I thought it might be a, a story worth sharing, nonetheless. And indeed, we do thank you so much for sharing that story. Arthur Robert, thank you for taking part in the mm -hmm. Native Veterans Oral History Project. Thank you.